We're in an age of wonders, of awesome scientific revolution. The reality is that any day now we'll be eating super salmon, the first genetically modified creatures approved for human consumption. And of course, modified plants like soybeans are already on the menu. But the revolution doesn't end there. Scientists can now re-engineer our lives in ways you never thought possible. Most controversially of all, they have the power to create designer animals with organs specifically for human transplants. So prepare to be amazed and maybe just a little bit afraid. On the edge of Newfoundland in the spectacular wilds of the North Atlantic, I'm about to wrestle with one of the great scientific controversies of our time. She's a fighter. That's going to be good because we're going to catch it too. Oh, nearly. Oh, they got a bit of muscle. Got him. So that's your pride and joy. Absolutely. Great fish, isn't it? How does it feel? Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that they was got, a good fish. They got plenty of growth that, hormone that was it. and muscle hormone as well. That's the fish that got away, right? The story you'll tell at home. Exactly. These are a new breed of superfish, genetically modified salmon, and they're about to make history. They're set to become the first genetically modified animals approved for human consumption anywhere in the world. And that makes their creator, Dr. Garth Fletcher, a very proud man. How does it feel to create a superfish? Well, it's just very nice. I'm glad you think of it as a superfish. It's a just a regular salmon, except it grows faster. A lot faster, up to 10 times faster than normal salmon, thanks to growth genes from other fish species spliced into their DNA. <laughs> now, the key to all of this are the big fish and the little fish are the same age. They're exactly the same age, fertilised at the same time and cultured at the same, under the same conditions. All these fish are just six months old. The bigger ones carry Dr Fletcher's controversial genetic modification, the smaller ones don't. Commercially, I can see why you want to do this. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But while the fish farmers are hailing this genetic tinkering as a miracle that will feed the masses, environmentalists have labelled these salmon frankenfish. Never mind calling me names or the fish names. The thing is, is it safe to eat? That's the question. Not the label of it. And is it safe to eat? I think it is. I know it is. I was going to pick you up on that. Do you think or do you know? I know it is. Sometimes you just got to say no to certain technologies. Just because it can be done doesn't mean that it should be done. And with these salmon, I'm telling you, it shouldn't be done and they should never be released into our oceans and into our rivers. Washington lawyer and scientist Andrew Kimbrell is one of America's most outspoken campaigners against genetic engineering. These genetically engineered crops and fish can cause new allergies, they can lower the nutrition in the food, they can cause toxicological responses. Food that was formerly safe can now become toxic. We've never done any long-term testing on these foods, and yet we've let them into our supermarkets and we're feeding millions of people this food. Just as alarming, says Andrew Kimbrell, is the threat to native species. In North America, there are fears the new super salmon could escape from fish farms and wipe out the already threatened wild salmon. If one of these genetically engineered organisms is released into the environment, you can't recall it. It's not coming back. It will grow and disseminate, and if it's going to be damaging, it will be catastrophic. They come in, and they contaminate, and they destroy. How does that sit with you? It, it, well, it, it's highly imaginative. You dismiss it? Well, I mean, it's a highly unlikely scenario that he's speaking of. Highly that, unlikely? Well, I feel it's highly unlikely. And what we plan to do is produce animals which are sterile, so when they're grown in the environment, at least they can't uh, mate with the wild salmon. Can you guarantee 100% that all the genetically modified fish that you produce will be sterile? Well, I don't think anybody can guarantee anything 100% in this world. What I can guarantee is that much of the processed food we're now eating in Australia contains genetically modified ingredients, imported from overseas. But soon, we'll be growing our own. This is a test crop of engineered canola in Wagga, New South Wales. Now, it's claimed this canola will improve weed control, produce bumper crops and generally make our lives a whole lot better. 
but the company that actually created it, Bayer, won't talk about it. Let's talk about what the crops are really doing. I am so tired of hearing that these crops are going to save the world. When it all comes down to it, again, we've got one genetically engineered crop that lets us put more herbicides in the environment. That's the bottom line. It's in America that much of the genetic revolution is now taking place. And it's happening in the most unlikely locations. So how many pigs have you got in the program? We've got about 200 pigs on the farm. And of those, about now 100 of them are clones. From this isolated farm in rural Virginia, Dr. David Ayres is pioneering genetic research he believes will revolutionise food production, medicine and even warfare. This is one of our cloned babies for our xenotransplantation product. What a little beauty. This little piggy is a very special little piggy. It's been genetically engineered to make its organs suitable for transplantation into humans, a risky and so far unsuccessful procedure known as xenotransplantation. So potentially, this little piglet could one day supply me a heart if I needed a transplant. A heart, a kidney, islet cells for diabetes, a whole variety of tissues. Genes that would normally cause organ rejection by the human body have been removed from the DNA of these pigs. And human genes have been added to further improve compatibility. So, in effect, these pigs are part human. We have the opportunity to you know, turn the transplant field on its head and you know, solve the, the organ shortage crisis. We've got 80,000 people you know, waiting on uh, organ lists, dying waiting for those organs. We have the chance to have an unlimited supply. But while trial transplants into baboons have begun, there's serious concerns about the health risks these organs might pose. There's already evidence that benign viruses which exist naturally in pigs could be transferred to humans with catastrophic consequences. We know this is how AIDS was created. We know that almost all these terrible flus, SARS that we just went through, uh, swine flu, uh, avian flu, mad cow disease, we know these diseases, many of which we cannot e e even detect, go from animals to humans. And now the, the brilliant idea is to take these organs and put them directly into humans. If you want to have a, a, a good guess, a good gamble on when the next, where the next plague is coming from, it will come from xenotransplantation. I can't say there's no risk. They're, they're infinitesimal, but not zero. Can you understand people saying, hey, no matter what assurances you give me, this still frightens me? The people that are saying that are not sick people dying on waiting lists or people having to undergo, you know, 30 years of dialysis. Those are the people on waiting lists that, are, that have diabetes, that are blind or, you know, undergoing uh, amputations for their disease. They're going to be the ones that are screaming for this technology. David, how's this group of cattle being modified? We've added a different human gene to these animals. This is a, a human milk protein gene to make a better infant formula that's more nutritious uh, as well as less allergenic for those people that have milk allergies. Rather than creating disease, Dr. Rez says he's helping the world fight it. He's developing new drugs and vaccines in the milk and blood of these animals that he believes will help defeat everything from simple allergies to deadly plagues unleashed in biological warfare. So you inject the pig with an anthrax or Ebola and then create this antibody, this vaccine. Right, that then can be used as a vaccine for preventing this disease in thousands of soldiers out on the field that are exposed to biowarfare agents or a whole population of a, a, a city with a million people that get exposed to it as an aerosol from a terrorist. What about the possibility though of an infected pig escaping and getting into the food chain? Well, it's very unlikely that they're going to escape because they're in an enclosed building and then by law we have to double fence them. So you guarantee our safety? Sure. No question. No question. But despite all the assurances, genetically modified animals have made it into the food chain. So far, none with exotic viruses, but certainly some pigs and possibly other animals with human genes have slipped through. It is very probable that somewhere in America right now, hopefully not the person you're looking at, uh, has already consumed an animal with human genes in it. And, uh, really? Yes. So a sausage on the barbecue could well contain human genes. 
could have human genes in it. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Well, this is where the magic happens, I guess. This is the cloning lab. So there seems no end to what scientists can achieve by mixing and matching the genes of various life forms. But just how far should they go in reshaping our world? Already, biotech companies have created featherless chickens, animals that glow in the dark, tomatoes containing fish genes, and even mice with human ears grafted to their backs. People say, you are playing God, you are meddling with nature. And that is not our domain. As we have for hundreds of years, you know, as soon as we domesticated animals and crops, we began genetically modifying them, not directly, but actually very crudely, by random breeding, by selecting for traits that we want. This is actually an improved process because we're very precisely targeting gene one, gene two. We know what that gene is going to do. We know what knocking it out or adding it is going to do. So we're, we're actually uh, being much more specific in how we're playing God. I love this argument. I call it the beer and yeast argument. Hey, we've been doing this for thousands of years. They've taken human genes and put them in mice. They've taken flounder genes and put them in tomatoes. I know of no natural situation where humans have mated with mice, thank goodness, <laughs> or fish have mated with, uh, you know, with, with tomatoes. Uh, this is new. We have never been able to cross species boundaries like this ever in history. And it is something we all need to look at very, very carefully. <laughs> And perhaps with good cause, as there's already evidence this technology is flawed. Even the much-publicised cloning procedure that created Dolly the sheep has proven to be fraught with problems, producing animals that die premature and, at times, painful deaths. Does anybody in the right mind think suddenly now we're going to limit this to its beneficial purposes? We already haven't. We've already seen some of the problems. We don't know what we're doing with cloning. We are seeing giantism. We've seen these, these little clones become huge. We, we're creating monsters, and we don't know why. So maybe we should stop. Perhaps the most cautionary lesson of all is the story of America's Beltsville pigs. These pigs were engineered with human growth genes, genes that got wildly out of control. The pigs were riddled with disease, and within a year, most were dead. Rob, it feels like the master and the apprentice. You're doing pretty good. Back in Newfoundland, on the pristine reaches of the Humber River, folk like Rob Solo aren't too sure about the science of this debate. All they know is that should one of the super salmon escape into the wild, it could spell disaster for their prized native salmon. What's at stake? A whole, a whole river, a whole species. And it wouldn't take too long. There's a real move afoot throughout the world to say no to gen genetically modified foods. And why should the salmon be any different? It should be treated the same. Why fool with nature? Why, why fool with perfection? Historically, this is one of the world's great fisheries, isn't it? Oh, yes. We're standing on the, on the edge of the Grand Banks, which is the largest cod fishery in the world, or the largest fishery in the world. Undeterred by the stink over his controversial salmon, Dr. Fletcher has grand plans. He hopes to revolutionise aquaculture worldwide and create a new industry here in Newfoundland where much of the once great fishing fleet now lies idle. His next challenge, to convince the rest of the world. Do you believe in what you are doing, that it's safe and right? Yeah. Because some people would argue... I mean, it's certainly safe, safe, safe for human consumption. I have, no, I have no doubts about that part of it. Now, right, what does that mean by right? Does an animal have the right to a certain genetic integrity? Do a few researchers have the wisdom, have the right to change forever the permanent genetic code of salmon, of all the crops of the world, of all the animals of the world, of human beings for fun and profit? Do they have that right? We don't believe that they do. Well, I mean, frankly, I mean, it would be really nice if we had nothing but wild salmon out there all the time. We didn't have to do this. If you wish to have fish on your plate in the future, aquaculture is the way to go. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.